What is going on guys? Welcome back to another Kerbal Space Program video. And I know I said that in this episode we'd be going to Duna, but I thought that it would actually be kind of cool to showcase a place that most people kind of overlook when it comes to their career slash science slash sandbox uh, playthrough, and that is Gilly, uh, which is actually one of the easiest places to visit in the solar system. And it's a really, really good like beginner destination for doing an interplanetary voyage for reasons that I will cover in this video, but I guess well, I'm going to talk about the build whilst it's happening on screen. Uh, pretty standard upper stage at this point. We've got the the cockpit that we've been using in all of our rockets so far, a heat shield with full ablator, because you may end up coming in at pretty high speeds because we're coming from inter interplanetary space. I've also added some batteries, solar panels, and crucially, that communitron just there, because we're going all the way to EVE, and we're going to be taking Bob Kerman again so he can restore the Mystery Goo and Science Junius experiment units. And so we want to be able to we want to be able to create maneuver nodes whilst we're out in deep space. So we need to be able to remain in contact with the tracking station. So that communica communitron, <laughs> it's a really hard word for me to say for some reason. Uh, that communitron will be able to keep us in contact with the Kerbal Space Center at all times. Other than that, the lower stage is pretty simple, really. You know, we've got the main, the main engine being the swivel engine flanked by two reliant engine side boosters, which you can see there. And we're going to connect them via a fuel line to the central core. So the central core remains fully fueled by the time it comes to detaching those side boosters. And that's pretty much the rocket in a nutshell. Uh, I guess in a nutshell is a weird choice of words, but go with me. You may notice that it bears a lot of resemblance to a lot of people's MUN rockets. And the reason for this is because Gilly is effectively the MUN in terms of Delta V requirement. The general rule of thumb is that if you have a rocket that can go to the MUN and back, you have a rocket that can go to Gilly and back. Generally, I would recommend having a little bit more Delta V for Gilly, just because it's a little bit more complicated to do the maneuver nodes. But if you've got about 4,000 meters per second in low carbon orbit, you're pretty much good. Here you can see me on the map screen. Uh, we're waiting for an EVE transfer window. So if you were to draw a line from Kerbin to the Sun to EVE, the angle that that line forms at the Sun will be about 54 degrees with EVE behind Kerbin. So imagine a clock face. Kerbin's about 3 o'clock, EVE is about 5.30. But here we are on the launch pad getting ready to uh, launch off the launch pad. Now in terms of our actual ascent, which has now begun, <laughs> I don't really want to talk about it too much because we're now... Ooh, I don't, how many episodes are we even into this series? <laughs> it's been so long. Um, we, we've done a lot in this series, but that way I've shown you how to get to the Mun, I've shown you how to get to Minmus, and how to escape Kerbin's sphere of influence as well. So at this point, you should hopefully have uh, your general ascents down, and you should be able to do ideally Mun missions without the need for a video co-pilot. So if you haven't managed to do those things, I would recommend getting more familiar with the Mun before attempting interplanetary. But if you're confident in your abilities, and hopefully you don't, you need no introduction when it comes to doing an efficient Kerbin ascent. So I'm going to show the ascent just so you can see what I'm doing uh, for flying this specific rocket. If you're having some weird uh, problems with this design yourself, but uh, I'm not going to talk about it too much because I feel like I've already discussed how to get into orbit at this point. This is a good exercise for the viewer to do attempt at home. So earlier on in this commentary, I said that uh, Gilly is a really good destination for beginners. And although I kind of explained that by saying that it requires about the same amount of Delta V as the MUN, uh, I wanted to elaborate a little bit more on that. So for your first interplanetary voyage, I would actually recommend just trying a one-way EVE or DUNA trip, ideally with a probe, or if you have no soul, I guess you can send a Kerbal, but I would recommend a probe one-way trip, uh, just so you can get to the base, get to grips with getting an encounter with a planet without having to worry about having enough fuel left over to get back to Kerbin once you're done. And the great thing about DUNA and EVE is that because they have atmospheres, EVE is a little bit more substantial than DUNA's, you can land using parachutes. Trying to get an EVE landing or a DUNA landing is a really good first interplanetary mission. And once you've managed to do that, then you can move on to the easiest two. I guess easiest three would be Gilly, Ike, and DUNA, which in terms of order of complexity, I'd probably say Gilly and DUNA are about tied. Uh, Ike's a little bit harder, but they're all pretty much the same caliber in terms of difficulty. So I decided to tackle Gilly in this episode. Uh, the reason I wanted to do Gilly in this episode is because, first of all, it doesn't require quite as much tech as Juno because you don't have to worry about landing in an atmosphere. So you don't have to have anything like landing legs or complex ascent modules because it's very easy to ascend from, unlike Juno, which is a little bit more complicated to ascend from. But I'd be lying if I said that the main reason I wanted to do Juno after doing Gilly is because I wanted to unlock some bigger parts 
uh, to do Duna because Duna has a pretty cool system around what well, it has Ike. So we could get a really big rocket so we can visit Ike and Duna. And it'd be nice to have, be able to bring more than one Kerbal with us to kind of have a bit more of an epic voyage. And so, you know, Duna is, you know, a, co a very cool destination. I wanted to do it the justice. I wanted to do the Duna vision, the time, the Duna mission that I envisioned for this series. So, well, Duna will hopefully be next week. Uh, I wanted to showcase Gilly because you don't need quite as big, t as much tech to do Gilly. And by doing this mission first, we can unlock all the bigger parts, bigger fairings, bigger rocket pieces to really do the Duna mission that I want to do. Uh, you probably won't have this problem if you're playing along with this at home because you won't have the arbitrary rule of only being able to get science from one biome per planet. But I have imposed that rule on myself. So here you can see me adding a menu node before it goes away. Uh, I'm dragging it out to be about 1,200 meters per second, making sure our dotted line fires backwards along Kerbin's orbit so that we end up in a lower orbit around the sun rather than a higher one. Uh, yeah, as you see, I've got about 1,250 meters per second, in fact. Then basically, use your mouse, drag the center of the maneuver node, and just keep spinning it around Kerbin's orbit uh, until you get those gray orbit indicators lining up and you can get a pretty easy even counter. I probably made it seem a little bit easier there than it is. It may take you a little while. The best advice I can give is just to keep practicing and playing around with a maneuver node maker. If you don't get a maneuver node and it's really not working, just close the maneuver node and then make another one and see if you can have another go. Uh, not much I can really suggest other than, you know, practice. There are other videos out there that specifically look into getting encounters with planets if you really are struggling. But for me, when I was learning this game, I would just create maneuver nodes in low curve and orbit like that, provided I was at the correct transfer window, of course. And it's not too difficult to get an encounter, especially with Eve, which has a massive sphere of influence, second only to Jewel, and I guess uh, the sun, if we're being nitpicky. Uh, so it's pretty easy to get encounter with. So there's so usually when we're getting close to ending our burn, I tend I generally just close the maneuver node maker and then carry on with the burn and just watch those grey orbit indicators align manually. Just because once you get towards the end of a maneuver node burn, if it's especially if it's a particularly long burn, it's not the most accurate. So by closing it at the very last second, like within like ten seconds to go, you can kind of just watch and fine tune it yourself. So I didn't aim for any particular kind of Eve encounter, just an Eve encounter with its sphere of influence to begin with. Then we're going to create a maneuver node about halfway along our journey, and we can fine tune our Eve periapsis. So first thing we're going to do is uh, adjust the inclination by pulling on normal and anti-normal to get our periapsis aligned with Eve's equator roughly. And then we're going to use retrograde and prograde to uh, bring that periapsis nice and low. You are trying to make sure it's roughly lined up with your descending node. You have to make Gilly your target in order to see the descending node and sort of get it roughly at Eve's uh, equator, you know. And then just finally make sure that your actual trajectory across Eve is with its rotation. So you can see we're going to be passing over it. So we're not going to be going against Eve's rotation. If you're not sure if you're going the right way, just use a bit of time warp and see which direction Gilly orbits around Eve. If your kind of escape trajectory takes you in the same direction as Gilly's orbit, then you've got it right. But that was that. So we're going to just initiate our burn. It's fairly, I did actually overshoot it a little bit, but it's fine. Uh, we can just watch that go. Not much more to comment on, really. I feel like I always end up having to, I end up missing the footage I need to talk about. So I end up talking really fast. And then by the time I've caught up, uh, I have nothing left to say. And I just end up staring at the screen in silence. So there we go. We've got a pretty good, it doesn't really matter about being too accurate, to be honest. As long as your periaps is kind of a roughly a long the descending node and that your kind of eventual orbit will be roughly in line with Gillies. It's not a problem. We have loads and loads of Delta V in this rocket, so we we can afford to make the odd minor mistake here and there. Now, next thing we're going to do, uh, Eve is a very deadly place to aero capture at, so we're not going to risk aero capturing. I'm just going to create a maneuver node at our Eve periapsis, uh, just and just make it so you're just capturing. So very very elliptical. You want to make it so your apoapsis just appears and no more than that. You don't need to burn any more than that. So that's that's the next step in this mission. So we can go ahead and time warp our way down and get to it. And by it, of course, I mean Eve, which is now looming ahead. We are well within its sphere of influence. We've got a big, big burn here. Uh, one of the biggest in this mission. So we're going to just time warp our way down. One thing I should have mentioned earlier, actually. <laughs> Hopefully you've watched this video all the way through. You're not watching it through for the first time in real time whilst you do this mission. When you set up your midway burn that will kind of, you know, correct your Eve encounters so that your periapsis is nice and low like we did earlier, um, 
I would recommend making a quick save before you execute the burn, but I recommend making an, like an alt quick save, so hold alt F5, so you can then name the quick save something, just because sometimes, for whatever reason, you don't get it right, or your ghillie encounter doesn't end up working quite so well, you could just go back to that point in time, get your Eve encounter again, and just try again, basically. Sometimes things just don't work for some reason. Uh, well, there's always a reason, but it can sometimes feel like it's not happening for a reason. If you really are struggling to get your ghillie encounter, then you can always just revert to that quick save and try again. So now that we're safely captured around Eve, we can start doing some science, because we're now at a new planet slash area in the game, so I'm allowing myself to do some science. So the first thing we're going to do is the Mystery Goo Science Junior Units. We can do a crew report as well, being sure to go on EVA, right-clicking our capsule, pressing Take Data, and then storing it so we can do more crew reports. As we go along, we can also do a barometer reading, a temperature reading. Can't do a seismometer reading just yet because you need to be landed somewhere to use the seismometer. But other than that, we can do all of our experiments. We can also do an EVA report as well from space near Eve. That, of course, means we can do some science from space high above Eve as well. Now, you can see we couldn't delete our maneuver node earlier because we didn't have a connection to the KSC. But by just time warping up a little bit, we're no longer obscured by Eve. And our little commutatron there can connect to the Kerbal Space Center. And we can edit our maneuver node and create a new one. So for our maneuver node, we're going to create one at Apoapsis and drag it out to a point where our new periapsis will intersect Gilly's orbit. Don't have to worry about getting an encounter like those grey encounter nodes just yet. We just need our periapsis to encounter, to like cross over Eve's um, Gilly's orbit. So we're going to just time warp our way up and get ready. Oh, I overshot it by a minute, but it's not a problem to be too accurate because the maneuver node indicator on the nav ball is pretty smart. It can compensate if you overshoot slightly. So yeah, we can do our burn. Not much more to really discuss. You all hopefully are well versed in what burns look like at this point. And again, I'm just going to delete the maneuver node and just eyeball it for the last few puffs, just so we can make sure we're getting nice and accurate. And we can see those grey uh, maneuver node indicators are appearing, which means we are crossing or at least getting very, very close to Gilly's orbit. Now what we're going to do is create a maneuver node at our periapsis and just drag the retrograde mark, and you can see those grey nodes swing round really, really quickly, and we can get a ghillie encounter that way. If for whatever reason they're not swinging around like that, just create your maneuver node to be a little bit after your periapsis, and then it should hopefully work. <laughs> anyway, we've plotted our maneuver node. As you can see, it's a very, very short burn, only a mere 32, 33 meters per second. So we can just time warp our way down and get ready to execute it. So of course, it's a 30 second-ish burn. So we're going to start burning 15-ish seconds before we reach our maneuver node to get an optimal amount of energy being used, but honestly, it doesn't make too much of a difference with such small quantities of Delta V being dealt with. That's a mouthful, isn't it? Now, I was being very careful trying not to overshoot the maneuver node burn this time, so it's going to gradually, gradually, gradually drop out of time warp. Uh, there we go, nearly ready to burn, and uh, never mind, overshot it by a second, but I think a second we can live with okay. So again, just before we finish that burn, we're going to just close out of it and manually watch those indicators. Now, the ghillie sphere of influence is very, very small, so unless you're burning really, really steadily, you'll overshoot very easily. So yep, we've got a nice ghillie apoapsis. Uh, you know, ghillie is so small in terms of its gravity well, Things like the O-Birth effect may as well not exist. So don't worry about having your orbit pass over in any particular fashion or getting a particular height for your apoapsis. Just encountering Gilly's sphere of influence is enough to get an efficient kind of landing and circularization and all of that. So a bit of a long wait for Bob Kerman to sit in his capsule awaiting his encounter with Gilly. But there we go. We're just time warping down and we're about to see the asteroid come into view. Where is it? I'm just panning around. There it is! I was trying to pan around to see if I could see it before I entered it. Sphere of Influence is a little game I like to play. Although I try and avoid it when I'm trying to record footage because I appreciate it will look very nauseating to viewers at home. So, we've entered the Sphere of Influence. I actually just closed the maneuver node. I saw it was a 30 second burn, so I'm just going to start burning 15 seconds before we reach our periapsis around Gilly. Periapsis around Gilly is weird because it's, it's technically our apoapsis, but I guess we don't have a periapsis, so it's our, it's our Gilly apoapsis, right? <laughs> Anyway, there's our burn going there. <laughs> and wait for it. You're about to see what I mean when I say that Gilly's sphere of influence is very, very small. Or at least its gravity well is very small. See how quickly I suddenly went from being not captured at all to suddenly on a collision course. So this is actually fine for a Gilly landing. I'm going to let it burn. I'm just going to burn a little bit prograde just to ensure that we're landing on the lighter side of the asteroid so that, you know, the video is not too dark and it's easy to see what's happening. But of course, now we're in Gilly's sphere of influence. We haven't got to worry about circularizing and all that. We can do some science 
from space above Gilly, I suppose. So crew report, EVA report, science junior, mystery goo, barometer and thermometer. Be making sure to take the data from the command pod and then storing it so we can do another crew report once we're at the surface. And when we're in space, uh, low over Gilly, because right now this is space high above Gilly. So you can always do two lots of science from space high and low above a celestial body. There it is, looming into view. I've just realised, does that break my rule that I can only get science from one biome from a planet or moon? Oop, I don't know. I mean, the thing with Gilly is that it's really, really good for farming science because it's even easier than Minmus to biome hop. Literally, it will take like five meters per second to change biomes at Gilly. If that, that's a very generous overestimation probably as well. You can pretty much just cartwheel your ships around Gilly by just spinning them around so they kick off the ground and then land somewhere else. So you can farm science from Gilly for pretty much free. So you could probably, at this point if I wanted to, I could probably max out the entire tech tree or get at least get darn close to doing it. But I imposed the rule that I can only take get science from one biome per planet so or moon or asteroid i guess if we're being finicky so that's all we're going to do in this video so we're in space low above gilly i think it's safe to assume just before we hit into the surface so we can do some science there and then we're just going to land so landing on gilly is pretty much this is pretty much akin to docking with something like an asteroid i guess like when you're doing asteroid capture missions because as you can see it's surface gravity is so low we're not even stopping so make sure you click on the nav ball and set it to surface if it didn't do it automatically like mine didn't and then just point retrograde relative to the surface and kill your velocity to a either 0.1 meters per second or zero or 0.2 as i apparently did in this case anyway now we're technically on the surface and landed we can do our science so if your ship ends up bobbing up and down you could always time warp uh, very carefully uh, so it will drift down and hopefully settle and then once it has we can run all of our science experiments and of course now that we're on EVA uh, above the surface we can take a surface sample yeah just the act of Bob scrambling off the rocket was enough to send it ricocheting off into into space again I'm pretty sure he could catch it though at that blazing speed so, yep, always good to plant a flag and label the biome that you're in. So if you come back in the future, you know to avoid that biome if you want to maximize the amount of science that you want to get. But I think everything we need to do on the surface is done. We need, to, we need not let this video drag on longer than it needs to so we can get ready to get Bob back to Kerbin. And getting back to Kerbin is fairly interesting. I guess not interesting, but it's not always the most intuitive path for people that are not that experienced at the game. So I'm, I hope you guys are looking forward to that. Anyway, there's all our science scroll through. So we're going to get lots and lots and lots of science from this. So we can get lots and lots of big parts to do a nice big Juno mission. So I'm going into a 90 degree uh, vector here. I'm burning along the 90 degree vector. I don't really know why, because again, it doesn't really matter with Gilly, because it's so small, uh, you'd have to worry about being efficient at all. So just going for a nice high apoapsis. I, I, I had this idea that I was going to circularize. I sound like a bit like a seal then, didn't I? I, 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 uh, I was going to circularize around Gilly and then just decided that's, I don't know why I did that. So I circularized around Gilly very quickly. And then I said, yeah, you know what, let's just go. We could just go leave. Let's, we could leave this terrible place and never return. So we get ourselves into an EVE orbit and get ready to plan our escape back to Kerbin. We have just over 900 meters per second, so more than enough to get back to Kerbin. Oh, what a beautiful shot. I might uh, turn off the UI and get a little screenshot for my wallpapers album. Look at that. Beautiful. Mwah. Anyway, that was a, a weird tangent. Sorry about that. <laughs> we can time warp our way out of Gilly's sphere of influence and start planning our escape route from Eve. So we're out of the trees, but not out of the woods just yet. We've got out of Gilly's sphere of influence, but now we need to think about getting back to Kerbin. So Kerbin's actually in a pretty good spot for us to get straight back there. So first of all, I'm going to just time warp so that we're not obscured by Eve. In fact, no, that wasn't the problem. I had left my antenna retracted. It's a good idea to retract that antenna when you do your gilly landing, just in case your rocket rolls and ends up breaking the dish. I'm going to show this as an example of how not to get back to Kerbin. We're going to create a maneuver node at our, at our periapsis, I beg your pardon, which is the most efficient place to burn. And it's going to cost us about, I'm not getting a perfect encounter there, but it's going to be about 950 meters per second to get a Kerbin encounter. 
This is not the way to do it though. I'm now going to show you the correct way. We're actually going to burn retrograde to lower our EVE orbit. So in theory, we're burning completely the wrong direction now. This is like a very counterintuitive maneuver. But by doing it this way, we'll be performing our escape burn far, far closer to EVE's surface. And the Oberth effect states that the closer you are to the surface of a planet, the more efficient your burners are, at least when it comes to prograde and retrograde burns, which are the, the kind of burns that we're concerned about for this maneuver. So it's going to be, uh, let's round, let's be generous. We're going to round it up to 200 meters per second for our burn to actually lower our orbit around Eve. There goes the maneuver. Now, now I'm going to aim for about, I usually aim for about 150 uh, around Eve. So uh, there it goes. So, oh, oh, I'm getting adventurous. 120,000 meters is hereabouts. So yeah, as long as it's kind of above 100k, you're probably going to be fine. And then I haven't actually yet done uh, science from space high above E, so we can quickly do that before we embark on the next stage. So remember that, 200 meters per second so far. Obviously, to not do it this way would have been about 1,000 meters per second. So we're down 200 so far. 800 remain to match the uh, the other method of getting back to Kerbin. So we've got a great maneuver node here. Drag it out, and then we can just get our way to a Kerbin encounter. So it's not a very efficient Kerbin encounter. If your fuel reserves are not as uh, <laughs> plentiful as mine, you can use something like Kerbal Alarm Clock or Transfer Window Planner to get a more efficient encounter with Kerbin. But as you can see, we've got enough to get a Kerbin encounter from here. And it's only 309 meters per second. So 300, let's say 310 for argument's sake. 310, 410, 510 meters per second. And we're actually getting an encounter with Kerbin's sphere of influence, which we weren't doing with the 950 meters per second burn. So by doing it this way, we've saved almost another five, we've almost saved half a kilometer of delta V. So although it seems counterintuitive at first, this is the power. You guys get to see it firsthand. The power of the Oberth effect isn't science. Great. And then very slowly doing our burn. There it is. Our uh, Kerbin Perapsis materializes. Now, it's going to be a very trivial amount of fuel to get that uh, aligned so that we're actually going to be entering Kerbin's atmosphere. We're not, this isn't an SST or anything. We only need to, we only need to uh, capture the uh, the command module itself. We have 200 units of ablator, which is more than enough for what we need, probably double what we need. So I'm not going to be worried about uh, doing a capture burn at Kerbin. So we're going to create a maneuver node. Uh, at a relatively high point in our orbit around the sun to save on as much fuel as possible. Generally, the further away from the heaviest object in your orbit, so in this case the sun, uh, the cheaper normal and anti-normal burns will be. And there we go. I'm going for a you don't need to get your perhaps perfect, just kind of kind of close to Kerbin surface. We can do our radial in burn once you've entered the planet's sphere of influence to get our final approach sorted out. So, yep, only 20 meters per second. So, uh, I hope this is a good showcase of the power of the Oberth effect. Okay, I'm going to stop saying that now. So yeah, I mean, our mission is approaching its end. I hope this was an informative video because, uh, like I say, Gilly is a pretty underrated destination and it's a perfect place for people to get to grips with interplanetary missions or even when you want to do your first interplanetary missions with a very limited tech tree. Uh, this is actually a kind of recreation, I guess, of one of my very, very, very first uh, commentary videos I ever made in Kerbal Space Program back in the prehistoric age of 2016 when I first started doing commentaries like as the main kind of video. Uh, it was called Low Tech to Gilly and I made a point of only doing the mission using like tier 4 and below which I think I've, I've kind of foregone a little bit in this episode just because uh, back then communications weren't a thing. You didn't need to worry about maintaining a connection to the KSC because that feature didn't exist unless you used mods, but now it does. I had to break that rule a little bit and use some pieces from the higher up in the tech tree, but honestly, if you're concerned about unlocking the tech tree, you should have already done a Mun landing and Minmus landing by this point, and by that point you would have unlocked some sort of communications dish anyway. So you can see I did a radial in burn. I kind of didn't talk about anything just, just then, but I hope you could kind of see what was happening on screen. But yeah, we did a quick radial in burn going for a 33,000 meters above the surface periapsis. <laughs> That's a weird sentence. And I guess we could just shut off SAS and watch our ship cruise in. And it's always good to look at the stage you detached just because you get a free fireworks display. And Bob Kerman is loving it. Just make sure that you do take all the data from the uh, science modules if you haven't done so by the time you re-enter because unfortunately, if you haven't by this point, you have lost the data that was stored in those units. So I'm just going to speed up the footage just now and we can coast our way down and 
prepare to land. And yeah, we got a parachute. Landing on Kevin's pretty easy. Hope you would. <laughs> you should probably know that by this point that you could land on Kevin with parachutes. And there's nothing more. I'm, ju I'm just I'm just watching the footage trying to find interesting things to comment on, but there isn't really anything interesting to comment on. So I guess I can discuss my favorite uh, food. At the moment, it's probably chimichangas. You know, I'm liking chimichangas, although I am trying to cut back a little bit on the old empty calories. It was my birthday not that long ago and ate a lot of bad things, drank a lot of bad things. So uh, uh, legal things, no, don't do drugs, don't do drugs, kids. <laughs> but uh, I'm trying to undo the carnage that was that weekend. So, you know, trying to be a little bit healthier this week. Uh, that's my interesting life story <laughs> that's going on so far. 2,775 science units earned on that mission. And hopefully for you, you earned a little bit more than that because you went to some additional gilly biomes. But uh, I didn't, so uh, I guess I can't talk about the hypothetical size that you might have earned. So it's time to open up the tech tree and see what we can unlock. So basically everything in this column just here we're going to unlock except some of the aerodynamic pieces because we don't need them. You can see I spent a little bit of time pondering what all the units uh, I would be unlocking. I wanted to try and unlock the gravioli. That was kind of the key thing I wanted to unlock, which is one of the last science modules we need to unlock uh, at this stage in our uh, mission to unlock the whole tech tree. So we're going to unlock the scanning tech and advanced science tech nodes on the tech tree. Just we have, we've got the, what we've got, we've got an atmospheric analyzer, we've got a ground, I can't remember what those red and blue pieces do, but we've got the gravioli, that's the key thing. <laughs> uh, so we've got lots of new science experiments, we can really maximize the amount of science we can get for flights going forward, which of course means that we can even further better our Duna mission when it comes to doing it. After that, I'm just spending science here and there. We don't need, like I say, some of the aerodynamic pieces and we don't need the actuators, no but aside from that that's this mission done so i hope you enjoyed it guys and i hope you enjoy the next mission when we get round to doing it on screen there are some links to the full lan aerospace playlist on the left and a video chosen for you by youtube's recommendation algorithm on the right there is also a link to subscribe and check out the patreon if you would like to and in the description you'll find links to instagram merchandise and discord thank you for watching this video guys i hope it was well worth the i hope you enjoyed it <laughs>